But today we're reading again the first section of Luke chapter 11 where Jesus teaches about prayer. Uh, Over the next four Sundays we'll be taking a a short break from Luke but again we're going to be looking at this theme this morning and Gary is going to come and read for us Luke 11, 1 to 13. So over the past couple of weeks, we've been looking in some depth at the Lord's Prayer in the first four verses of this chapter. I mean, we could call it the Disciples' Prayer, as it was the pattern that Jesus taught his disciples then for disciples in any time and any place. And it is such a short, simple outline, and yet there is so much depth to it. Jesus taught us to address God as Father. To seek the honour of God's name and to long for his kingdom to come in our lives, in the world and fully when Christ returns. He taught us to ask God for everything that we need for life, material and spiritual, knowing that he has promised eternal fullness. He taught us to seek and offer forgiveness and to recognise that we cannot stand faithfully without him. So it gives us the basis for prayer that that God is our Father who has already promised these things and will act on those promises. It directs us to the request that we should prioritise and and throughout, because of the, the nature of the requests, it points us to a right attitude in prayer. Humility, confidence and expectancy. And in this section from from verse 5, Jesus is still responding to the disciples' request, teach us to pray. And I think we can only properly understand this section in light of what we've just heard, in light of the Lord's Prayer. There's quite a clear logic to this as well. It starts with just a focus on how we request on our attitude, but then it closes with an emphasis on the goodness of God in what he gives. So let's first of all look at verses 5 to 8. And Jesus basically saying to to the disciples, right, picture this. A friend turns up at your door unexpectedly in the middle of the night. Culture demands that you offer hospitality. If you leave him out there, Or don't give him anything. You're bringing shame on yourself 
and your family. But the kids have stripped the cupboards bare. So you go along the road to another friend. You know that his wife baked bread earlier and she always makes enough for a few dates. So you bang on his door and call out to explain the situation. Your reputation is at stake here. But this other friend's already gone to bed. The whole family would be sleeping together on a raised platform at one end of the room. So if he gets up, the wife and kids wake up too. And you know how it is when your kids wake up. You've got to get them a drink of milk. You've got to settle them down again. You've got to sing them a lullaby. Get them back to sleep. It's just a nightmare. Go away. But you don't go away. There's quite a lot of different translations of the word in verse 8. What Gary read uh, was boldness. In the ESV that I've got here, it's impudence. It can be translated persistence, brassness, shamelessness. My favourite is shameless audacity. You'd need shameless audacity to go and bang on your neighbour's door in the middle of the night. Not just waking him and his family, but all the neighbours as well. And Jesus says that in in this circumstance, friendship is not enough to get him out of bed and give you some bread. But your shameless audacity, that's enough. Now, we have to make sure here not to make a big mistake in understanding this little parable. God is not the sleeping friend. God is not reluctant. He does not need to be cajoled, bullied, embarrassed into answering prayer. He doesn't give us what we want just to shut us up and make us go away. No, the rest of this passage, as we'll see, it leaves us in no doubt about God's gracious generosity. This little story in these first few verses, it's not actually about God. It's about us and how we pray. And the question is, do we pray with this sort of persistence, with this sort of boldness? Do we pray with shameless audacity? Now, that phrase in relation to prayer, in terms of us and our relationship to God, might make us a little bit uncomfortable. We're supposed to be humble, yes, confident, but humble, coming to the creator and ruler of the universe. Is shameless audacity appropriate? Well, look at it this way. And particularly in terms of the the requests that Jesus has just taught his disciples to pray. Do we care enough for the honour of God's name that we will persevere in seeking it, that we will refuse to be deterred from asking for it, that we will be more interested in seeking him than in what's nice and proper and what seems to be a polite form of words. Do we care enough for our faithfulness as witnessing disciples in the world, that we would persevere in asking God to keep us faithful, that we would refuse to be deterred from asking God for it, that we would not worry about what's nice or proper. What about when we pray for the salvation of a friend or a family member? Are we more concerned about being nice and proper or are we bold and persistent? See, there's a kind of shamelessness that is totally appropriate. And that's a shamelessness that is asking for something that is right, that is good and godly. So what do you think God is more concerned about? Our politeness, our polished words, or our persistence, our passion for his honour? for his kingdom we talk about pouring out our hearts to God we saw that in the psalm in the psalm I read at the start it's an old testament term that implies passion but the, it's almost passion almost doesn't do it justice there's almost a sense of agony in it it's deep 
It's visceral. It's seeking after God because we are desperate. Because we know that we need him. Desperation and dependence are not pretty. They're not honourable in the eyes of the world. But they are the right position for us before God. Do our prayers express that? Do we pray with shameless audacity because we are desperate, because we are dependent, and because we know that God's will and God's way are to be valued above anything else we could ask for? I'll say it again. We don't pray like this because we think it's how we get a response. We pray like this because seeking God is too important not to pray like this. And the next couple of verses really develop this sense of persistence, but also begin to combine it with the assurance of God's goodness. I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. And then the next verse says almost exactly the same thing. Jesus repeats it. Shows how important it is. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks it will be opened. Ask, seek, knock. The outcome is certain. Because God is good and gracious and trustworthy. And if you think about the verbs that Jesus uses there, there's a sort of rising intensity here. To ask is simply to request help. To seek implies a lot more effort. It is an active thing where you're going out, you're you're seeking out that help. To knock is then giving you this impression of the perseverance, hammering down the door. More literally as well, they read, keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. True prayer is not for the lazy. It's not for the inactive. And nor is it just for those who follow a religious ritual. Asking, seeking and knocking is not a a, a sort of point system. Where you earn favour, you earn credit until you get the answer that you want. It's an attitude of the heart. It is a demonstration that what we are praying about really matters to us. And again, this is one of these places where we have to really remember the context. Remember what it is that Jesus says we are asking for and seeking and knocking to receive. The context is the Lord's Prayer. There is no place for the theology that says that if you believe enough or ask enough, you'll get whatever you want. But it's saying, believe and ask for God's name to be honoured. If that's what you want, if you want God's kingdom to come, if you are asking for your daily bread, for forgiveness, for help to stand as a faithful disciple in a hostile world, if that's what you're asking for, then you'll get it. Ask, seek, knock for these things. Remember that even then, They don't come because we earn them. They come because of God's gracious will. Now we've seen how passion and persistence in prayer, they flow from what we consider to be important. From what we truly value. But I think it's also true the other way around, that the more we persist in prayer for something, the more we learn to value it. It's not often easy to persist in prayer. But as we seek God constantly for his kingdom to come or for a friend to come to know Christ, we will increasingly see how important that thing is. We'll increasingly see the glory of the kingdom. We'll increasingly see God's heart for that friend that we want to come to him. And so we will pray more and more passionately and persistently. We might say, oh, I'm really struggling 
I'm struggling to be persistent in prayer. And I, one of the things I have to say to myself is, are you even trying to persist? Where is the passion in your prayer? It's not that we work up to it. It's that the more we persist in prayer and seeking God for these things, the more we long for them. The more we want to persist and seek God. Prayer like this both reveals our heart, but it also shapes our heart. And I think it also reveals where our confidence is placed. If we're asking for something, but have no confidence in the person we're asking, no confidence that they will give us what we're asking for, then we will give up pretty soon. And just thinking in, again in terms of my own kids, um, if they're asking me for an apple, then they can ask with confidence, and um, even if I uh, am too busy to respond immediately, which, believe it or not, does happen. Um, they keep asking because they know that the answer is likely to be yes. If they're asking for a second packet of crisps that day, then they give up pretty quickly because they're not going to... Well, two of them do. <laughs> they're not going to get it. If you're asking for something and have no confidence in that you'll receive it, whether because the person just isn't going to give it or because it's not something that you should be asking for, you will give up far quicker. But God has promised to answer. God will always answer according to his will and for his glory. And that should enable us to keep asking. It should give us the confidence to keep praying, to keep persisting because we rely on him, because we trust him. There's, there's so many examples in scripture of this sort of passion and persistence in prayer. I'm going to give you two. And one of them may seem a little bit left field, but bear with me here. Genesis 32. Story of Jacob. And in that chapter, Jacob is on his way back to meet his estranged brother, uh, who he didn't treat very well and is expecting a hostile reception. And on his way, he, in the middle of the night, uh, happened, uh, uh, he, he is sleeping in a, or, or, or sleeps apart from the family to protect them. And a man comes upon him at night and he wrestles with this man. And, and the man, it turns out, was God. Probably a, a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. And they wrestle all night until, until dawn. And Jacob refuses to let him go until this man blesses him. And this is the response. Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. And of course the name Israel would come to refer to all God's people. To Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and their descendants. To, and then in, in terms of the prophecy of the Old Testament, it points forward to the church, to God's people by faith. That name Israel means he strives with God. Now, Jacob was wrestling, not praying. But despite knowing this man was out of the ordinary, even divine, despite knowing that this man was great enough to bless him, Jacob holds on. I, I wonder if in that situation we would say, well, who am I to wrestle this man? Who am I to demand a blessing from God? If, if God wants to give me a blessing, he'll, he'll give me one. I'll just back off and see what happens. I, I, I think actually many people would respond like that, but, but Jacob doesn't. Um, Jacob, I, we, we know from other passages, he was pretty shameless in his, his audacity generally. But he was shameless in audacity here. He was persistent until he received that blessing. And I think there is a picture here of prayer. I think we can apply this to the type of thing that Jesus is talking about here. To saying with absolute 
confidence. God has promised this and I will persist. I will hold on in prayer to this promise and I will ask for it. I think there's, there's a, a sort of sad irony in the name Israel. He strives with God because so much of the story of the Old Testament is the story of Israel striving against God. But I also wonder if, if perhaps there's something in that name that implies that actually this sort of striving with God, this sort of passionate, persistent prayer is to be a hallmark of God's people. You think of the Psalms and how often they talk about seeking God, about waiting on the Lord. And I wonder if there's something in that, that actually this is one of the things that sets God's people apart. Is that we strive with God in prayer, that we are passionate and persistent in seeking his will. So there's Jacob, the other highlight, the other example that I want to highlight is of course Jesus himself. We've seen it in, back in Luke 6. Faced with the decision of choosing the 12 apostles, Jesus spends a whole night praying on the mountain. This decision mattered. It was too important to take lightly. And we see that throughout the Gospels. Whenever something important is happening in Jesus' ministry, a shift perhaps in his ministry, he spends the night in prayer. It's his pattern. He is striving with God. He is persisting in prayer, knowing the importance of what is happening. And of course, the, the, the ultimate example, if you like, is in Luke 22. They're in the garden on the night of his arrest. You have this contrast between the disciples and Jesus himself. Jesus reminds his disciples of part of the Lord's prayer. What he teaches them in verse 4. Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And they fall asleep. But Jesus, faced with the unimaginable anguish of the cross, faced with the cost of fulfilling God's eternal plan of salvation, faced with the temptation where he prays, take this cup from me. He prays in increasing agony. He is more than passionate. He persists in prayer and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. That's pouring out your heart. There's an agony in that. Relating to the importance of what he's praying about. Relating to the importance of what is to come. The passion and persistence of Jesus' prayers show that absolute commitment to God's will. But also absolute trust in God that he will do his will. Hebrews 5 verse 7 says, In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. The answer to all of Jesus' prayers was exactly what he sought. It's exactly what he prayed in that agony in the garden. Not my will, but yours. He prayed for God's will with passion, with persistence, and God's will was done. So let's just sum up where we are so far before we go on to these last three verses. We, we've seen passionate, persistent prayer. It flows from a recognition of what's truly important. And flows from confidence that God will answer according to his will. It recognises as well that God's will does not always match our desires and expectations. The answer may not be what we want. But Jesus paints another picture here in these last three verses. It shows that God's will and glory are also for our good. Like I say, not necessarily what we want, but always for our good. We have this image in, in verses 11 and 12, which is both comical and pretty hideous. The idea of a father... Handing a child a live snake when they ask for some fish to eat. Or, or handing him a scorpion when he asks for an egg. It's the stuff of horror films. 
it turns the stomach when you actually stop and think about what, what that image is. And it's, it's even worse when we think back to Luke 10 verse 19 where Jesus talks about snakes and scorpions. And as we said then, they are generally representative of the evil one. So it's not just sort of some sick joke. It is handing out evil to a child who asks for good. In verse 13, Jesus says, You then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children. We, we see the evil in that image. It turns our stomach. It's, it's horrible to think of a father doing that. And yet Jesus is saying, well, even the best of humanity is evil. We are so far short of the glory and righteousness of God. And I hope none of us have ever played such a sick joke as this on our children. But no parent is ever perfectly good to their children. Who of us, who are parents, could ever say that we have parented without selfishness? Without anger, without unfairness, and even in, perhaps not to this extent, but cruelty in some ways. And yet there's enough of the image of God remaining in sinful humanity that our inclination is to give good things. We work, we save to give them good gifts, to to feed them, to give them a good life, to protect Sadly, even that inclination is tainted by sin. The things that we think our children need are not always what's good for them. And we pander to their desires and spoil them. But Jesus' point here is that if in our sinfulness, though we are evil, we know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more, how much more, Will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The equivalent verses in Matthew's Gospel are more general. They just speak of God giving good things. And that perhaps links more to the material view of daily bread in the Lord's Prayer. God giving all we need for life. We know, of course, that God gives far more than the basics in what we need. Paul says in Romans 8, He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? But all things there, I think, primarily refers to spiritual things. We see that in 2 Peter 1. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And of course, there is no greater gift that God could give us than himself. There's that eternal hope. Again, this links into to the emphasis of the Lord's Prayer, that we're praying for what we need now in confidence of what God will give in eternity. So there's, there's the eternal hope that God will give us himself. We will spend eternity in the presence of God our Father. But there's also the present reality. Now we enjoy Emmanuel, God with us, dwelling in us by the Holy Spirit. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? When we want God's name to be honoured, hallowed in our lives, it is done through the Spirit. When we want to live under his kingdom's rule, we do so through the Spirit. When we ask for all we need to live daily as disciples of Jesus Christ, it is given through the Spirit. When we long for the ability to forgive as we are forgiven and to stand in the face of temptation, it is given through the Spirit. Back in Ezekiel 36, God promises with his glory in mind to renew his people. Even with the law and all the history of God's work, people are incapable of living in a way that honours him. So he promises to forgive and to transform, to give true life, to give a heart of flesh instead of our heart of stone. And then he promises this, I will put my spirit within you 
and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my laws. The only way that we can live in God's way as we were created to live is by the Spirit. And the Spirit is given to every true believer. So we have the Spirit in our lives, but we still pray for the work of the Spirit in our lives. I think Ephesians gives a really good example of this. In, in uh, Ephesians 1.13, Paul writes that we were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. And that seems to be speaking of that gift of the Spirit to all believers. To all who have heard and believed the gospel. But he doesn't just sort of stop there with the Spirit. He goes on to pray in verse 17 that God may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. And then in chapter 3 that we would be strengthened with power through the spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. We have, as believers, the Spirit in us, but we need his ongoing work, that we might know God more, understand his word, that we might live in the experience of his love, that we might have power and boldness to live as witnessing disciples, that we might become more like Christ. And reflect God's image more fully. And the wonderful thing is that God promises to give us all this. So when we ask for the spirit to be at work in us. The God who has already given us the spirit. Will answer that prayer. We can have confidence. We can persist. And be passionate in that prayer. The spirit is described as a seal. But a guarantee, assuring us that the saving work of Christ is complete and sufficient, assuring us that we are secure as God's beloved children, and also giving us a taste, the first fruits of the life to come. The Spirit is also a guarantee of the promises of God. As we said, God has already given the Spirit, so we can trust that He has given and will give all we need to live. As disciples, we can trust that the work that he has begun in us as his disciples and the work he's begun in the world through the church, that it will be completed. His will will be done. And he longs for us, knowing that this is sure and certain. God longs for us to pray with passion and with persistence for these things. To wholeheartedly depend on him for these things. And we can do this. We can do this because the word of our Father is sure. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the certainty of your promises. All your promises are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. And we have the spirit, the promised spirit in us. A reminder, a guarantee of the sureness of your word. But Father, forgive us that so often we doubt that word. And so often we don't value it as we should. So we ask, Lord, that you would impress on us what is of true worth. That you would remind us again of the grounds of our confidence. And that you would help us, Lord, to seek you with passion and persistence. To seek for your name to be hallowed, your kingdom to come. To seek for all that we need for life and godliness. We thank you again that your promise is sure. We thank you that we have a taste of that now, but that we pray also knowing 
that one day we will experience it in full, that we will be with you for eternity. Thank you for that hope. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank <laughs> you.